Good morning, everyone. If I had to give a title to this morning's talk, I would call it Discerning the Lord's Body. I'm really pleased that we have a motto, connect, serve and grow, because I think the one leads to the other. We need to be connected so that we come to know each other and how we need to serve one another. And that serving can lead to growth. Uh, I just want to focus on part of the first of those three this morning, the idea of connecting. One survey found that 80% of Americans believe that you can be a Christian without belonging to a church. And that isn't biblical. But it is a growing trend for a lot of people that they're happy to just stay away and carry out their kind of Christianity individually, all on their own. But the Bible will have none of that. We are put into a body of believers, and that's intentional. It's necessary. In fact, we begin our lives as spiritual babies when we are born again. And we're put into a spiritual family so that we can grow. That's why we're called brothers and sisters. Now, I don't know about you, but I've found being part of a family, a natural family, rather difficult. It's involved a lot of pain and difficulties, working out relationships um, and trying to help keep brothers and sisters together. And so it's not that we're put into a family because life's going to be easy for us. If you came to Christ for that basis, you've actually made a mistake. But we are put together to grow, and families help us grow. Jesus said to his disciples, I've told you these things that you may, in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. So let's not expect an easy time, even in the body of Christ. In a letter to God, a little girl called Nancy wrote, I bet it's very hard for you to love all the people in the world. There's only four people in our family and I can never do it. Now, she may have misunderstood the idea of love. And the English language confuses two very different aspects of love. I believe that the English understanding of the word love can come down to one of two things, and two of them... Um, you know, are sometimes necessary together, but uh, often they are referring to very different things. I can say, for example, I love chocolate. And I do. I really like chocolate. And that's all love means there. I really like it. I think Lynette likes it even more than I do. But the second and more important aspect of love is caring. I think most of the other aspects of love, the way we use the word, is really fundamentally all about caring. So when I say, I love Lynette, my wife, just in case you're wondering who I'm talking about, that's because I really care about her. I care for her. I care about how she feels. My concern is for her. Now, romantic love, maybe between a husband and wife and other situations, probably should involve both. It really helps if you really like the person as well as care for them. But it's really important to realise that love, in that biblical sense, that really caring, isn't dependent on the person. We are supposed to care for our brothers and sisters whether we like them or not. And we're supposed to care for our children as parents whether we like them or not. Um, one good friend of mine used to say to her children whenever necessary, I want you to remember I love you a lot, but I really don't like you right now. Because that's the message we should always, always convey. We need to really care about those who aren't necessarily nice to us and the ones who don't really care for us. So connecting to Christ means we need to connect to everyone who else is connected to Christ. We are brought together. And everyone here, hopefully, is either someone that is connected to Christ or who we are helping to connect to Christ. 
the crucial point I'm trying to get across, and hopefully we'll take a bit further as we go through this morning, is that we are brothers and sisters, and that means a great deal. You see, it's not a title. It's not Brother Clive Wilson or Brother David Herman, like Sir this or somebody that. Being brothers and sisters is a relationship. It means something relationally. It means that because I am your brother, you can come to me and expect me to care for you, to listen to you, to support you, help you, provide for you. And this is what I hope to receive from you. You see, we don't just have a social club here. It's more than just a community. It's a spiritual community founded on the love of Christ and the love of God. And we are to be to each other as Christ. It means at the very least loving as much as we would love our natural brothers and sisters. And if we don't, then we really are nothing more than a social club. This is really important. Jesus said, this is how the world's going to know who we are. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So we are a spiritual community, a family. And we are here for each other. And we should come specifically to be for each other, to come to connect with each other. So we go looking to spend time with that brother whose family is no longer with him, with that widow or widower who deeply misses their partner, with a single person who spends much of the time lonely, with the isolated or that person who's felt rejected and struggling. In fact, we are here for one another. It says in Ephesians 4, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. We are going to build up this community, this spiritual community, as we grow in love. Demonstrating that constantly. It also said later on, in that same chapter, let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. So we come along this morning and every other time we get together to speak grace to one another and to build them up. That hymn we sung has some beautiful words for us. We came to meet the glad with joyful smiles and to wipe the weeping eyes. We are to have a fellowship with hearts that we keep and cultivate. That's why we come. We don't just come this morning to be taught or to catch up with our friends. We come to connect to one another because that's what Christ wants done in this world. Paul seems to be saying that when each part of the body is working properly, then the body will grow, which infers if we're not growing as a body, then maybe we are not working as Christ intends. So meetings like this or CYC, youth group, any time we get together is for connecting with one another, encouraging each other, finding out who needs help or support, for demonstrating love. 
I'd like to suggest that no one should ever leave this place without having meaningfully connected it with at least one person. And I see some people who don't, who sit on their own, having perhaps talked to no one other than the person who welcomes them at the door and leaves. And we need to be on the lookout for that so that they can feel a part of the family. I see some who actually seem to want to leave quickly. And we should try and discourage that by welcoming them and trying to relate to them, to make them feel a part of this family, this spiritual community. We are more than just a group of people here and maybe we need organisation even to make sure that those people who are overseas or elsewhere in the state who don't get down here very often should have some meaningful contact with us. There shouldn't be a single person in this ecclesia that does not have at least one person they regard as a spiritual friend. Paul said, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honoured, all rejoice together. Are we living out that truth? Now, in case you think I'm exaggerating the importance of what it means to be brothers and sisters in Christ, I have collected together a range of quotations which just emphasise how much we are to be to one another. And they're going to be projected on the screen for you. The aim is not just necessarily to read them all. And if you want this list, send me an email and I'll send you the list to look through more thoroughly in your own time. But we are to love one another, Jesus says, as I have loved you. And we'll come back to that thought because that's a very significant thing. We are told at least 10 times in the New Testament alone to love one another. That means it must be really important and summarises perhaps so much else that is included in the New Testament. But we are to be devoted to one another. We are to honour one another. We're to live in harmony with one another, accept one another, just as Christ accepted us. It's always about how Christ has treated us that we then convey to our brothers and sisters. We are to greet one another. Don't just leave them sitting there. If someone's sitting on their own, go and greet them, welcome them, talk to them. We're to have equal concern for each other. Equal, that means no one that is our favourite that we just spend time with and ignore others. We are to be concerned for all. We are to carry one another's burdens. I think I skipped one. We are to serve one another in love. Carry one another's burdens. We are to be patient, bearing with one another in love. Sometimes people say or do things that aren't all that helpful good for our ecclesia, but we are to be patient with that, to bear one another. We are to be kind and compassionate to one another. We are to speak to one another with psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. We're to forgive one another. Forgiving is just an implicit. If we are in Christ, we are to live a life of forgiveness. We're to encourage one another and build each other up. We're to live in peace with each other. Be kind to each other and to everyone else. We're to spur each other on. We are to offer hospitality to one another. We are to clothe ourselves with humility towards one another. We're to have fellowship with one another. And a few fairly serious ones we probably don't think about very much. We are to instruct one another, and that doesn't just mean on the platform. We're to agree together with one another. We're even to submit to each other, to teach and admonishing one another. We're even taught to confess our sins to each other and pray for each other. And just coming back to the idea of love, above all, we are to love each other deeply. 
So as a spiritual family, we are to be building spiritual friendships. Now that includes biblically that we should be teaching and rebuking one another. I, just, I don't just want the kind of friend who's going to greet me when all things are going well and when I'm happy and uh, continue to encourage me. I don't just also want someone who's offering to help me when times are hard. I want someone to come and let me know when I'm full of pride or when I'm going astray in a way that can threaten my faith, when my attitudes are wrong. We need each other for that. The Bible says we are responsible for each other. I want you to be more concerned about my eternal well-being with how comfortably I'm going to sit with what you say, to have the courage to talk directly to me when I need it. And we need to be doing that for others. This is part of what it means to belong to a spiritual family, not simply a club. I want friends who will spur me on to being the kind of person that God wants me to be so that we don't fall into the trap of this age that says we should all be happy with the people we are. Where can we get that kind of love? Well, I believe that kind of love is just implicit when we are truly converted. When we comprehend the incomprehensible love of God, it should absolutely melt our hearts, smash our pride and enable us to love. Because if God loved us, we can love others. We love, John says, because he first loved us. And if we are the kind of people we are, and we know we're not the kind of people we ought to be, and if God was willing to sacrifice his son for us in love, then surely we can accept others who are not yet perfect either. Romans chapter 5 says, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. This is in the context of our conversion. 1 John 4 says, He who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. That was the message of that song that we had as our meditation song. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. But if we have love, we will also love our brother. If we don't, then we don't have love, the love of God in us. But I want to get now more specific. How do we connect with one another? And the answer is listening. We need to listen to each other. Listening is the language of love. Listening is the language of love. Until we really listen to people, we will not know them. We will not know their needs. We will not understand them. We will not learn to care for them. We will not be able to inspire them. Jesus said quite often, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. Which I think clearly tells us that listening is more than just listening. It's not just enough to know the words that are said. One study of communication, which you've probably all heard about, concluded that 55% of total communication is delivered by body language. 38% by vocal signals and a slim 7% by the words that are spoken. That's a pretty important thing to realise when we are listening because listening means looking, not just listening, not just hearing. Now, normal speech is at about 120 to 150 words per minute. But we can listen to 600 words a minute. That means we all have thinking time while we're listening. 
And it's what we do with that thinking time that determines whether we are really listening. You all know already what most of us do with our spare thinking time while we're listening. It is all too easy for us to think about what we're going to say in return, or if the person's boring, drift off to something else that we might be thinking about for the rest of the day. But we are to use our time, our thinking time, while we are listening to looking, noticing the tone, noticing the body language, and notice what is underlying the words that are being spoken. See, real listening takes things further and looks for the feelings of the person, not simply the content of what they say. We all know implicitly that if someone's talking to us and what they say and the way their body language speaks to us, that we will naturally tend to believe what the body says and not the words that are coming out of our mouth. Have you noticed that? It is much easier to interpret body language than it is just simple words. And that's very obvious when we deal with text on its own. How many people have had a text, uh, a, yeah, a text on a phone or an email totally misunderstood? I've had that happen with a student once where the person actually took the intent as the direct opposite of what I meant because they don't have the person there to see the way and the feeling that was behind it. And that's one reason why I recommend that we do a lot more talking face to face and a lot less talking by text or by phone. But even by phone, if you're talking to them, you can still hear tone and other signals verbally. But anything really important should always be said face to face. Now, I've uh, created a little um, slide here with using LISTEN as an acronym for a few other things to try and help you remember. L, LISTEN, stands for look directly. If you want to show someone you're really listening, then show them eye contact. Constant eye contact. Secondly, involve yourself. Smile, nod, show interest, because they need to know you are still listening. Experts say that our mind wanders every 15 to 20 seconds unless we do something about it. S, stillness. Don't interrupt. Don't move. Don't check your phone. Don't look away too much. Pay attention. T, Tune into emotions, the tone, the body language. Sense whether they are feeling afraid, angry or sad. E, empathise. Try to imagine or understand what their situation feels like. N, neutralise judgement. Don't tell them they shouldn't feel that way. Don't disagree with them. Don't tell them that they did the wrong thing. Don't minimise their feelings. Hold all of that. Listen and understand. We need to create a connection with them. And that's done by listening, really showing that we care enough to listen. Don't jump in with Bible wisdom and good advice. First, Communicate love. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. People will not believe God is love unless we demonstrate God's love to them. Genuine listening is powerful. It communicates that you accept the person, that you care, that you want to understand them, that the person is important to you. Heather Wagner, the BBC's Director of Internal Communication says, being listened to is so close to being loved that sometimes your brain can't tell the difference. As I said, listening is the language of love. 
Now, often we are not really listening because we don't want to hear what is being said. We don't really care. We're more than happy just to say, I acknowledge you, not in those words, but we won't want to have to have anything that we need to follow up with or act on. Our greetings can be absolutely automatic if we're not careful. About a week or two ago, I had someone who was walking past me that said, hi, how are you? I'm fine, thanks, and just kept on walking. Clearly, she wasn't interesting, interested in making a connection at that particular time. But I would hate to think that would ever happen here. A few more things about listening. There are things that we should avoid. Don't ever say, I understand what you're going through, unless you really have gone through what they're going through. Don't give pat answers, even biblical ones, like all things to work together for good, or that just may not be God's will for you. Avoid quick advice, because it may indicate you haven't really listened to what they've said and just want to end the conversation. It also has the possibility of just giving them the message that uh, I'm clever and I can see what your solution is. What a shame you can't. But it means that we may ignore the real need beneath the problem they are sharing with us. One that's very easy to do but should be avoided is never say you should do this. It creates an obligation. It takes away their freedom to deal with their situation as they think best. But we can make suggestions, but all we have to do is change two letters into one. Don't say you should, just say you could. And then we've left it up to them to deal with as they think best, while giving suggestions. But a few positives that we can do while we're listening. While you're listening, pray for the person. Pray for God to help you to understand what they're saying. Particularly pray for them if they are depressed or distressed. And pray for guidance as to know how to build them up. Another really important thing, particularly for a meaningful conversation, is to reflect back to them what you are hearing them say. To show them that you are really listening. This is called active listening. But we need to do it with tentative language so we allow them to check that we are really hearing correctly. So we say things like, are you saying that this? Or are you feeling such and such? And then they can go into more detail and clarify if we've misunderstood. We need to reflect and acknowledge the feelings that they are con conveying to us as well as the words, because it's the feelings that really matter. Above all, of course, we need to communicate acceptance that it's okay to feel that way, even if we would like to move them beyond that feeling that's holding them back. When we reject people's feelings, they feel rejected. But we should follow up on the person in need and pray for them. Have you considered praying for individuals in this ecclesia? Do you regularly pray for them? Do you pray for our arranging brothers? Do you pray for this ecclesia? Do you pray for our leaders and teachers? Do you pray for the people that you have talked recently to and know need your support? Because we can't ever have all the answers. We need God's help with those things. All of us who are members should be praying for our ecclesia, our spiritual community. Now, much of what I've said so far is the kind of information you could get from any communication seminar or good internet source. And sometimes they're just techniques that people use to to try and make a connection with a customer or convince them that uh, you're interested when they're really not. The best way to avoid fake listening is to genuinely care. When we have the love of God in us, we are to care for one another, actually care. 
It's also really important to, re to listen when we disagree with people. That's why the world these days is so polarised. People don't listen to each other than when they have different points of view. And so they don't even know how to respond to them because you don't understand why they think the way they do. So if we have a, an ecclesial decision and someone disagrees, the most important thing is to hear why they think the way they do before we respond and suggest what we think is a better understanding or a different perspective. And it's very valuable in conflict resolution. If you actually listen to what the person says when they're telling you what they think is wrong with you, it's quite unsettling for them when you say, so what you're saying is I really let you down and you're unhappy that I did this, this and this. And the minute they feel understood, it eases the tension and gives you a better basis for responding rather than simply reacting defensively. Because when we, are no, when we know we are secure in the love of God, we don't have to feel threatened that we may in fact have genuinely upset someone in ways that were justified. We can accept and agree with them when it's needed. But listening in this context means looking as well as hearing. From the minute you come in, look around. Look for the person who's sitting on their own and might need someone to be with them. Someone who's feeling unhappy. Someone who needs encouragement. Someone who can't look people in the face. Notice their anxiety, anger, sadness or pain. Or if it's a visitor that doesn't know anyone. So listening means tuning into those things so that you know who to connect with, know who needs your support. I know that means you'll probably spend less time chatting to your friends and your family, but you can do that at other times. We're here to connect with each other, to build each other up in love. When Paul talked to the Corinthians, he talked about their thoughtlessness about when they came to the bread and the wine and they had their meals separately and some had lots to eat and others had nothing. And he said, whoever eats and drinks without discerning the Lord's body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's what he meant. They knew that the bread represented the body of Christ. He wanted them to see the body of Christ as the people that needed equal concern. And if we come along here without showing equal concern to more than just our friends and ignoring the needs, then we can be failing to discern the Lord's body. Listening is much more than a set of skills. It really becomes most effective when we are humble. Our pride puts up a barrier and makes us talk as though we're superior. And we need to be humbled by the love of God. When we recognise our own true unworthiness, then we can be humble, but grateful that God has shown us his immense love. When we acknowledge how much we have failed, then we'll have no trouble accepting the failures of others and not feel better than them, because all of us are imperfect. God's grace means God accepted us even though we do not deserve his love and he wants us to do the same for others regardless of their merit. Jesus asked us to love one another as he loved us. What does that look like? One day in his life he came down from the mountain after teaching the people for much of the day. Then he healed a leper. Then he healed the centurion's servant. Then he healed Peter's suffering mother-in-law who had a fever. And then because they all heard about his healing, a whole crowd lot more, uh, more people came in the evening and filled the house and, and Jesus healed every single one of them and sent them away healed. On another day, Jesus was so exhausted with all that he did that he actually fell asleep in the boat in the middle of a storm that they thought might take their lives. 
He was just exhausted with giving. What am I saying? Jesus loves without limit. He doesn't hold back. And that's how he wants us to love. Love without limits. The gospel gives us two simultaneous truths. We are far worse sinners than we can ever realise, but we are more deeply loved than we can ever imagine. When we realise just how deeply we are loved, then we are able to love others. The gospel tells me that I am a mighty sinner, but I have a mighty saviour. In reality, he sacrificed much more than his life when he died. It only just struck me recently that Jesus had to be perfect for his sacrifice to matter. He needed to be the perfect sacrifice. So it meant that every minute of every day, of every week, of every year of his life, he had to obey God for us, never doing what he wanted, always resisting temptation, always caring, loving. All his life he loved. And then he faced the worst of all, suffering the shame and humiliation of crucifixion for you and for me. And if Christ will do that for us, then any little thing we do for one another pales into insignificance. Meditate on this every day and it will change you forever so that love can flow through you to others through his spirit. Amen.